In March of 2022, conservative media outlet The Daily Wire announced it would be investing $100 million into children's content over the next three years. On October 16th, 2023, they launched a new streaming service aimed at children called Benki. There were some fears raised about this being a platform to brainwash children into supporting a right-wing agenda, so I'm going to go into some detail about Benki, its programming, and try to make sense of what this all means for The Daily Wire. The origins of this initiative are a little murky, but one clear fact is that the name was originally DW Kids. Back in that press conference in March of 2022, it was said that this project was originally intended to be announced in November of the same year, though it was moved up on the schedule to take advantage of clips on social media spread by Christopher Rufo that supposedly revealed Disney pushing a secret gay agenda in their programming. On my little pocket of, like, you know, proud family Disney TVA, um, the showrunners were super welcoming, Meredith Roberts and like the, the our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. That clip is of Latoya Raveneau speaking to her own personal experience as a director on The Proud Family. But this was blown up to mean that Raveneau is some kind of big power broker in the Disney world and that there is some kind of secret gay agenda that they are putting into all of their movies and TV shows instead of it just being a producer on one show explaining her own experience. And that by putting this stuff into their movies and TV shows, this would somehow brainwash children. There was another clip that got heavily circulated featuring Carrie Burke, president of 20th Television, supposedly calling for 50% or more characters to be LGBTQIA and racial minorities, at least according to Rufo's tweet. Of course, if you actually watch the clip, you can see it's just not true. She literally does not say that. And I hope this is a moment where, shoot, um, the 50% of the tears... <laughs> Sorry, they're coming. She's getting emotional talking about representation because her kids are part of marginalized communities. And then she says 50% of the tears are coming. She's talking about crying, not casting decisions for future projects. Her remarks aren't even really about increasing the number of characters from these communities. Rather, it's about increasing the quality of characters within these stories, letting them do more than simply be the secondary gay character who tells a story about how horrible it is to be gay. They want to see these characters be part of the world and not have their otherness centered in all of their stories. There were also clips shared from this meeting where employees expressed concerns over Governor Ron DeSantis' recent bill that they believed would erase the presence of LGBT plus people, though it's never really explained how this means Disney has a nefarious agenda. Looking at the clips on their own, it really just reveals that some of the people who work at Disney have politics to the left of DeSantis and find his policies alarming. As the source of these leaks, no one should ever take Christopher Rufo seriously. He's admitted to muddying the meaning of words to advance his agenda and twisting facts to the point where they no longer reflect reality. Rufo's grift is made pretty obvious from this excerpt from a recent Vox article where his book, America's Cultural Revolution, was being reviewed. This article is written from the perspective of its author, Zach Beauchamp. Rufo claims business no longer exists to maximize profit, but to manage diversity and inclusion. This last line in particular struck me as absurd. Even he couldn't possibly think corporations cared more about their DEI than profits. When I pressed him, Rufa said the passage was intended to describe the ultimate objectives of Marcuse and his ideological heirs, not to depict reality. Further pressing yielded the claim that his book couldn't be read literally, that his artful and kind of narrative manner requires the reader to question whether there was a kind of literary device at play while reading. These clips from the Disney employees can probably be explained a similar way. They aren't depicting the reality of a company-wide policy regarding queer themes being put into every Disney project, rather some kind of ultimate objective in the future, existing in the land of the hypothetical. But that's a prediction that, so far, hasn't in the least bit proven to be true. As the article helpfully points out, it's not that institutions like businesses and governments have been taken over by leftists. Rather, these institutions have co-opted the messaging of left-wing critiques without radically changing anything. Disney still cares more about making money than it does about pushing any kind of gay agenda. And while various TV shows and movies include a little more representation, it's hardly the harbinger of some kind of socialist utopia. In this case, the narrative matters more than the facts which is why it was the perfect news story for The Daily Wire to latch onto to generate some attention for its kids' content strategy. 
By creating this sense of threat to its audience from Disney, they can then direct that audience towards alternatives that they happen to sell. The Daily Wire, with some help from Rufo, are creating a problem and then selling the solution. Back in that March 2022 press conference, two shows were announced for DW Kids. The first was Chilla Time by Eric Branscombe and Ethan Nicole. Branscombe had worked as a writer on the Christian animated series Veggie Tales in the House, and Nicole is the creative director of the conservative comedy website The Babylon Bee. This show would later be named Chip Chilla, and it follows the antics of an animated family of chinchillas. I'll have a bit more to say about that one later. The other show announced was Doodles with Noodles, about a guy who draws with a puppet. This one also features Ethan Nicole, though, as a performer and not just as a co-creator. So far, no release date has been announced for this particular program, and it may have been indefinitely shelved. I want to note that The Daily Wire's $100 million investment into children's content is in addition to another $100 million that The Daily Wire is investing into creating entertainment for older audiences. That's included releasing several movies to limited success. You can check some of my other videos on that subject if you want to see how it's going. All of this sounds like a lot of money being spent. And this is how Daily Wire President Jeremy Boring explains where the money is coming from. We believe that there is an underserved audience that is longing for these alternatives. There's an underserved audience that has just been waiting to purchase content that they can believe in. I know that 50% of everyone who encounters that content is going to want to come over to dailywire.com and subscribe here instead. The Daily Wire only rarely makes its numbers publicly available. We only have any sense of their financial health from some statements in 2022. Boring announced a run rate of $200 million in June of that year, though it was updated to nearly $200 million by November of the same year. This means that the company expected to earn $200 million in revenue for that year. We don't know how much of this revenue is being taken up by expenses. Boring has said that the Daily Wire is profitable, but how much profit it's making exactly is not really known at the moment. If that revenue estimate is accurate, the Daily Wire would need to spend a third of its revenue on its entertainment ventures every year for the next three years to meet the minimum spending limit they've set for themselves. That is a lot of money to be spending on a type of content that they aren't particularly known for. This push into kids' content is a major financial investment for the company and it relies on the assumption that there are many more potential customers who don't currently have Daily Wire memberships who are ready to open their wallets for its kids' content. The number of subscribers the Daily Wire has is also something of a mystery. Last year, we saw numbers in June of 890,000 subscribers, and that hit 1 million subscribers in November. So that's somewhere slightly more than 110,000 new subscribers over the course of six months. This was part of a big push for new subscribers the company was making that year, signing the likes of Jordan Peterson and making deals with PragerU. A growth of 12% for the company seems decent, though we don't really know how much they spent trying to get this all off the ground. And Jeremy Boring's ambitions require a lot more than 12% growth. Speaking to Axios in an article last year, he said, To succeed in our effort to create a true news and entertainment alternative for the millions of Americans tired of the hegemony of the woke giants, we have to grow 10 times, and then we have to grow 10 times again. Even with the numbers we have available, the Daily Wire needs to be growing much faster than it currently is to keep up with Boren's ambition of reaching millions of Americans. So this kid's content really needs to hit hard and generate a big influx of new subscribers to their services. DW Kids didn't do much to differentiate itself from Disney when it announced one of its first major hires, Chris Sonnenberg, an Emmy-winning showrunner from the Disney series Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure. If Disney is the problem, it seems strange to be hiring someone from there to serve as an executive producer, but he does have experience running a successful TV series, so it does make sense to hire him. Throughout 2023, we didn't hear a whole lot about DW Kids, aside from announcing that Rob Schneider would be playing Chum Chum Chilla, the father on Chip Chilla. We booked our entire cast as well, including our good friend, the incredibly talented and hilarious Rob Schneider. As someone who was keeping tabs on this project, I thought maybe they had run into some kind of difficulties. But then it was announced in October of 2023 that it would be debuting as its own distinct streaming service. And it was no longer going to be called DW Kids, it would now be called Benkey. This was done to differentiate it from the more overtly political projects that might come to mind when people find out that the DW stands for Daily Wire. They announced that an annual subscription for Benkey costs $100. 
If you're wondering where the term bent key even comes from, it apparently has to do with a key Jeremy Boring wears around his neck. The key is from a small theater in Texas that Boring used to work at. It has some kind of personal significance for him. Bent Key Ventures is also the name of the LLC that The Daily Wire is owned under, so the name isn't a new one for the company. When Bent Key launched, we got what seemed like some revisionist history. Going back to the announcement for what would be Bent Key back in March of 2022, Boring said that this was in the work for months. I want to be clear that DW Kids is not a direct response to the leak tape that we heard from Disney today. We've been working on this for months. In a more recent video, Boring said that this was an idea Ben Shapiro had after the Disney clips were posted by Rufo, and they just announced it as a spontaneous, ambitious venture. A little over a year ago, those tapes from Chris Rufo leaked of what was going on inside Disney, and you said, we should do something, we should launch into kids' content. I wrote you back and said, you don't know how to run a business. This is impossible. What you're, what you're suggesting could never possibly happen. And then I laid back in bed to go back to sleep for another 40 minutes. And as I sat there, I thought, damn it. <laughs> He's right. It's hard to make sense of these two conflicting stories, and it seems like a strange thing to lie about. It's hard to imagine the March conference was done spontaneously, considering they announced two shows complete with graphics and key creative staff. I'm not sure how you put that together in 24 hours, though it is possible that this was intended to be part of the Daily Wire Plus and not its own streaming service. Either way, it certainly wasn't the entirely spontaneous idea that Boring was suggesting it was when speaking to Shapiro. This is common in how Boring speaks, though, constantly exaggerating and presenting his business as some kind of fly-by-the-seat trailblazing mavericks. And we're snipers. They're just machine guns. We'll hit the target every single time because we have to hit the target every single time, and they don't. One of the overriding themes in the messaging around Ben Key is that the programming would not be in any way political. This is really a safe space for your kids. You can, you can put your kids in front of Ben Key and who actually share your values and who aren't going to seek to twist their minds in some particular political or cultural direction. So let's take a look at some of the shows on Ben Key to see how apolitical they may or may not be. Ben Key launched with 150 episodes from 18 different shows. There was a mix of original and licensed programming, with four of the shows being wholly owned by The Daily Wire. Of the remaining 14 other shows, 13 of them have been licensed, and one, Gus Plus Us, was not technically an original show, but now is in some kind of exclusive deal that has brought it over to Ben Key. Its first season streamed on Google Play and Amazon Prime. Let's look at the original shows first. The four of them are Chip Chilla, A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay, Kid Explorer, and Kid Fit Go. As the first show mentioned by DW Kids, Chip Chilla seems like the best place to start. In addition to Rob Schneider, it also features the voice work of Laura Osnes, who has been in several Broadway productions and made some headlines when she departed from a charity performance of Crazy For You because she didn't want to be vaccinated. The rest of the principal cast is made up of Lucy Capri, Josiah Hidalgo, and Deacon Branscombe. They are all children, so I have nothing to say about them other than they are in this show. Although I think, based on his name, Deacon Branscombe, who plays Chubbly Chilla, the baby of the family, might actually be the son of Eric Branscombe, who's one of the co-creators of the show. And if he's putting his baby into the show, I think that's incredibly sweet and adorable. The premise for Chip Chilla is that parents Chum Chum and Chinny are raising three children, Charla, Chip, and Chubbly. The kids get up to hijinks while the parents try to teach them some lessons about growing up. It's basic kids entertainment. If you were wondering about any politics in the show, for the most part, I didn't notice any overt right-wing messaging. While the kids are homeschooled, we don't get much in the way of critiques of the Department of Education or teachers' unions, at least not in the episodes I watched. And the series is still in the process of airing, so more episodes are to come. Although there are cameos by Jeremy Boring and Matt Walsh. I shall defeat Captain Bronto, for he is weak, and I am less weak. Of the two episodes I sampled, it was hard to really pull out anything other than the show being incredibly mediocre. The acting and animation is all serviceable, though the writing is flat, and the designs seem generic. As a grown adult, though, I'm not sure I'm meant to be assessing the quality of this show. It's meant for children, and it's entirely possible I just wouldn't understand what makes this show good or bad compared to other kids' shows. Or at least, that's what I thought until I did a bit more research. Anyone with youngsters in their life might be familiar with an Australian series called Bluey. It's about a family of dogs having fun adventures around their home. Upon the debut of Chip Chilla, 
many people noticed a distinct similarity between the two, from the animation style to the opening theme music. An interesting parallel here is that if we look at the first images of the Chinchilla program, back when it was called Chilla Time, the art style was very different. If we compare it to what Chip Chilla would eventually become, and put Bluey in the middle, it seems like one show likely influenced the style of the other. This similarity got some coverage in the Australian press, and it even garnered an article in The Guardian. There are striking similarities between these copy rats and our favorite healers. In response to these observations, specifically the article in The Guardian, Boring denied that they were trying to make a conservative Bluey because, supposedly, Bluey is already conservative. It also sounds like Boring is a fan of the show in spite of it streaming on Disney+, Plus, which again raises the question of how much of a woke agenda Disney has when one of its most popular shows is apparently conservative. He then added, Chip Chilla is wonderfully written, is utterly enjoyable, and is, of course, almost completely distinct from Bluey. In fact, the only real similarity between the two shows is that both feature loving and engaged nuclear families with great values who actually enjoy being together. While personally to me it seems like a bit of a ripoff, or at least heavily inspired by Bluey, the more important question is how do these two shows compare? So after watching Chip Chilla, I decided to watch a few episodes of Bluey. And after watching Bluey, I realized something about Chip Chilla. It's not that I, as an adult, can't infer some kind of quality from a kid's show, it's that Chip Chilla is hopelessly mediocre. Because Bluey is an absolute gem of a TV show. Dad, she's had this many times. You can be the bum bum ghost. The characters in Bluey are far more charming, and the lessons learned are more cleverly taught. For example, comparing the two, in the first episode of Chip Chilla, Charla and Chip have to learn that it's important to give consideration to their younger siblings. As oldest, I'm probably the only one who won't be scared by herself, so I'll stay. Yes, yes, yes! I'm first! Finally! Chip then learns from her example, which is perfectly fine. On the other hand, in the first episode of Bluey, with Bluey not letting her younger sister Bingo have a turn in their game, Bingo manages to get a hold of the pretend magic xylophone they were playing with to freeze Bluey so she can explain her feelings. You just take all of the turns, and it makes me feel sad. I will unfreeze you if you promise you will let me have turns too. Blink two times if yes. And Bluey learns the importance of including her younger sister. Here, Bingo, you can unfreeze him. Thanks, Bluey. Not just yet. I like the daddy water fountain. So two lessons are learned here. The importance of sharing during playtime, and taking the time to listen to your younger sister's feelings. It's a sweet little story and was handled in a way that felt more organic compared to the flash of inspiration seen in Chip Chilla. I don't expect I'll be keeping up with either of these shows in the future, but Bluey seems like the clear and obvious winner between the two. I found myself genuinely laughing at a couple of the jokes. That feeling seemed to be pretty popular. Writing for Slate, Dan Kois compared the two, saying, The action in Bluey is driven primarily by the children's imaginations. Bluey and Bingo put their parents through their paces, making them pretend to be on an island, act out a visit to a hair salon, or spray an actual hose in their own face. In Chip Chilla, conversely, it's the parents who drive the action, because the kids in Chip Chilla are being homeschooled. So when Chip pretends to be an astronaut, or his big sister Charla becomes a reporter for the Chilla Times, it's because fun-loving Chum Chum has told them to do so. The result is that while Bluey feels a little like magic, Chip Chilla, though it has a fast pace and some good jokes, feels like school, since that's exactly what it is for these kids. Some reviews from viewers are less kind. Thought it might look entertaining after seeing the change in design from the early initial reveal, so we tried it out. My five-year-old daughter and three-year-old son tried for an episode and a half before asking for something else. They clearly weren't feeling it, and my wife and I weren't either. We tried again the next day, but my daughter almost immediately wanted Gabby's dollhouse instead, and my son asked for Bluey. There were positive reviews, though, like this one. Bluey seems more for families, jokes and parenting commentary for the adults. This seems more for kids, clearer meaning and principle per episode. Teaches morals, lessons, and references classic novels and historic figures. The art style and music are the same as Louis, so if that bothers you, you could go watch another show. But the educational and entertainment value is there for my kids. 
I should know my kids are early elementary school age and down. My kids love it and are excited for Saturday morning cartoons. Here's to hoping enough people will support content like this. While there were plenty of other reviews sharing a variety of opinions, it was difficult to find ones that weren't bogged down as to whether this show was either a ripoff of Bluey or depended on how much someone loved or hated The Daily Wire. The positive ones did speak to what was driving a lot of the early adopters of this service, though, to fight back against Disney's supposed woke agenda. It's that grievance that fuels a lot of conservative politics. It's hard to imagine that same grievance would be able to fuel a media company that's looking to dethrone Disney. To marginally defend Chip Chilla here, regardless of what anyone might think about the individual merits of each show, the original is always going to have an innate advantage over the imitator. So Chip Chilla always had an uphill battle. And it's strange that Benke, which is trying to differentiate itself from Disney, would just make a copy of one of its most popular shows. While imitation is the sincerest form of plagiarism, it doesn't quite live up to the promise of providing a genuine alternative to Disney. This is a pattern we're going to see with Ben Key. It's not really bringing anything new or different to the table, just watered-down versions of things we've already seen. That brings us to the next original, It's a Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay. It stars Katie Chase, who co-created the series with her husband, Ryan Chase. They operated a children's improv class in Los Angeles for 10 years, which has apparently given them the experience they needed to make a children's TV show. Although Katie had appeared in a handful of small roles on TV, it was the personal relationship she and Ryan had with Jeremy Boring that got them the chance to make this series. Jeremy Boring highlights the show in particular as the big standout on Bent Key. When people look back at our legacy 100, you know, 50 years from now, that's the thing that they talk about the most. Maybe we make 100 or 200 or 500 episodes of Mabel McClay and there will be kids who say, yeah, my childhood was Mabel McClay. Mabel McClay obviously owes a lot to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood the PBS classic that is widely regarded as one of the all-time greats in children's television. As a side note, Fred Rogers was also a champion of public television and in general seemed like a great guy. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is also a full repudiation of the idea of apolitical children's television, and Fred Rogers would often include progressive political messages in his show. For example, he was subtly endorsing integration during the civil rights era. Actor Francois Clemens reflects on his time working on the show. To say that he uh, didn't know what he was doing or that he accidentally stumbled into integration or talking about racism or sexism, that's not Mr. Rogers. It was well planned and well thought out, and I think it was very impactful. Perhaps his finest performance in front of children was his testimony in front of the U.S. Senate in 1969, where he made a powerful speech to protect public broadcasting. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service for mental health. Uh, I think that it's much more dramatic that two men could be working out their feelings of anger, much more dramatic than showing something of gunfire. Those are some pretty big shoes to fill. In an interview, the chases seem pleasant enough, and they are particularly keen on keeping the content apolitical and also not including any references to their Christian faith. So how is A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay? It begins with an opening theme that I can only describe as low effort. Well, it's a wonderful day. 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 As a comparison, Mr. Rogers sang a whole song about being his neighbor. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? It might not be entirely fair to go straight to the gold standard for shows like this, so let's take a look at the opening theme to the Canadian knockoff of Mr. Rogers, Mr. Dress Up. Mr. Dress Up doesn't sing, the little animated intro is a bit more involved and charming than the one you hear for It's a Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay. One of the goals of Mabel McClay was to provide a more relaxed, less hyperactive version of children's television, and it's evident that the energy on the show is turned very low compared to other shows that bombard kids with sounds and images. They gave me this wonderful box. Sure makes a good whatchamathing to wonder about. 
Let's take a look. Sure is nice, isn't it? The premise is basically Mabel is hanging around her house, enjoying her day by talking to friends and learning about the world. The episode I watched focused on creativity, with each section kind of reinforcing that idea. In this one, she talks to her puppet dog friend. She speaks to banjo player Ron Block. And there is an animated story about a rabbit learning to be brave enough to create. There is some solid advice in here for kids, like when Ron Block suggests that if you're having trouble being creative, it's a good idea to take a break and let yourself recharge. I think the hearts of the chases are in the right place, and I'm not going to pick apart every aspect of the show and pretend that the animated cardinal wearing the police badge is some kind of endorsement for a theocracy. The show itself is just kind of a slow, chill vibe, and it seems more bland than wholesome to me. Like, look at this Rube Goldberg machine they make. It's just a ball going down various ramps. It's kind of wacky and weird, I guess, but not in a way that's very interesting. After watching the show, I felt a lot like Mabel Blaclay after she watched the animated section of her own show. Wasn't that something? It's probably not going to be bad for kids, and unlike Chip Chilla, the inspiration is a beloved classic and not a show that's currently running on another streaming service, so one can argue that this show is filling a void. Not that other shows aren't also trying to fill in that Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood space, such as Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. But the sad part about Mr. Rogers' legacy is that it looms so large that no one will readily admit that anyone does that type of show as good as he does, or better. Or it would have to be so much better that it would undeniably top the original. And Mabel McClay certainly doesn't do that. One interesting thing I do have to say about the show is that Jeremy Boring originally had another person in mind for a Mr. Rogers-type show. What we should do is hire Glenn Beck to be Mr. Rogers. I mean, Glenn Beck is Mr. Rogers. If this had been Glenn Beck as Mr. Rogers, it could have fueled an entire video, because I'm not only certain the show would have been overtly religious, it would have also had some absolute nonsense in it. Like when Glenn Beck wrote a children's book about Christmas, and it Santa Claus was Jesus Christ's Batman-like protector. Learn more about it in my video on the subject. Also, since we're talking about Glenn Beck, I'd like to remind everyone that in 2011, after a shooting in Norway where a man murdered 77 people attacking the Workers' Youth League summer camp, Glenn Beck compared the camp to the Hitler Youth. While he condemned the violence, I don't think murdered children learning about political activism should be compared to being indoctrinated by Nazis. And that comparison should disqualify Glenn Beck from ever being compared to Mr. Rogers. The next two shows, Kid Explorer and Kid Fit Go, I'm going to talk about together because they come from the same production company. Or I should say production family, because these two programs are produced by the Fulcher family. Bubba and Elizabeth Fulcher, along with her kids, Elijah, Olivia, and Caleb, started producing videos back in 2019. Using Bubba's background in video production and Elizabeth's background in education, they put their kids front and center to start in a series of videos on YouTube under the channel name Kid Explorer. They made many attempts to launch different kinds of shows like Kid History, Biz Kid, and Kid Fit Chef, but the metrics on the channel were not the most promising. A handful of the Kid History videos did well, and one fitness video called Kid Fit Go managed to get over 1 million views, but views drop off considerably over time, and the trailer for their new season that never happened, at least on YouTube, got less than 5,000 views. They attempted to make this brand more than a YouTube channel, though. There's a whole website that includes courses for schools and all sorts of other materials. Or rather, their website used to have all that stuff. Now, it mostly just points people towards Benkey. The project seemed like something of a dud until the Daily Wire rolled in to buy it. The result of their purchase is that two shows that have a very YouTube feel to them are now on Benkey. Kid Explorer is a bit longer than its Kid History predecessor, offering a very quick look at the history of something kids might be familiar with, like phones. Standing in stark contrast to Mabel McClay, this show is very fast, with quick cuts, rapid jokes, and lots of insert footage from popular media. Although I remember myself asking who this show is really for, when in the first episode we got a reference to the 90s sitcom Saved by the Bell. The idea for everyone having their own cell phone wasn't even a thought for most people, except for this guy. Hello, who's calling? Zach Morris. That joke is probably for their parents. That, combined with the frantic energy, makes the whole experience seem less about learning and more about the wacky antics you see Cal get up to. It's a lot of noise being thrown at you. For the Daily Beast, Joe Berkowitz explained it well, writing, 
Will first graders have some innate understanding of the stand-up comedy brick wall backdrop in the show's mic drop segments? Will they be able to correctly identify Zach Morris from a photo? And will they care after their mom explains who that is? And will they recognize the Joe Rogan announcer meme when it inexplicably pops up during an episode on Abraham Lincoln? If so, this child could probably just bypass an anti-woke kids TV streamer and graduate to Netflix. KidFitGo promised to be a fun way of exercising, but instead of making it fun games or challenges that kids can do while exercising, it's pretty much just a workout routine featuring children. We can see Cal from Kid Explorer as one of the three kids in this routine. He's joined by Elijah, who was seen in the earlier days of Kid Explorer, but I'm not entirely sure who their new friend Emery is. This recasting seems to replace Olivia, which I think confirms that Ben Key has gone completely woke. So score one for the left here. Seems a little cold-blooded to cut your sister out of your exercise show, but hopefully she just didn't want to participate. I tried the workout myself, and it was a decent bit of exercise. Certainly nothing that would really challenge an adult, but for kids it's probably fine. The only part of it that really exhausted me was being told, That's how you kid fit go. That is how you kid fit go. That is how you kid fit go. Now that is how you kid fit go. And that's pretty much all there is to say about these two programs. They're YouTube shows with a budget. I'm not sure why someone would pay to watch them, though I suspect it was easier to buy the rights to these than it was from various international programs that were also licensed for the platform. The licensed programs on Benki were all completely foreign names to me, quite literally, since the majority of them are produced in other parts of the world. They're almost entirely from Europe, many of them several years old. Surprisingly, many of them are French, such as Louis and Yoko Build, Runes, and Ernest and Celestine The Collection. But there's also Jasmine and Jambo from Spain and Clangers from the UK. One of the main criticisms I have for these shows is not really about their content, but that several of them are freely available to stream on YouTube. In the case of How Ridiculous, that's just a YouTube channel that you can watch for free. Other programs that aren't already on YouTube are on streaming services such as Prime Video and Apple TV+. There isn't much incentive when these programs are already available elsewhere on platforms that have way more content available. Many of them have dozens of episodes of these programs that Ben Key is missing as they're rolling out their library with new additions every Saturday. Saturday morning cartoons is a cute idea, but if I have a kid who wants to watch 20 episodes of something now, it's a lot easier to just open up Amazon Prime rather than tell them to wait five months for them to all come out. A lot of these services also have special modes that limit content to exclusively show kids programming. The only thing you're really preventing your kids from seeing is supposed left-wing content in their children's programming. Not all of these licensed programs are waiting for their episodes to be added on each Saturday morning, though. A number of episodes for some of these shows have been removed entirely. Jeremy Boring says as much right here. We've edited every single episode. Some of the shows that we would license from around the world, maybe there were three episodes that we didn't agree with. So we just threw those episodes out. They're not on the platform. Every single piece of content that a kid will be exposed to on Bent Key, at a minimum, will be neutral in terms of, you know, the sort of woke identity politics of, of the moment. It does raise the question which episodes precisely were removed and why. Looking over the episodes that are available on Bent Key, you can make a decent guess over which ones were skipped over based on other episode lists on other streaming services or IMDb. But since Ben Key is still adding new episodes and doesn't always stick to the same order as these other places, it's impossible to be absolutely certain that missing episodes aren't coming out sometime in the future. For example, Clangers is missing an episode that seems to be a climate change allegory, with everyone working together to help deal with a bout of cold weather. And Truck Games has a missing episode where the mini trucks sample windmill power a city, which could be seen as an allusion to green energy. Of course, Ben Key has new episodes planned for many weeks more, so it is possible that these episodes could appear down the line. Even so, I do think it's interesting that these particular ones were passed over. However, Boring's comments earlier about removing certain episodes mentioned woke identity politics, and that makes me think the episodes removed probably has something to do with representation. I didn't really spot anything like that in the few missing episodes that I could identify, so maybe these are episodes that are yet to be not included on the Daily Wire service. 
Looking over the response to Benke, particularly from those who don't like the Daily Wire, many have observed that the programming isn't very political. That is, it doesn't contain the obvious right-wing messaging of an episode of Ben Shapiro's show. Several articles have pointed out that it mostly reinforces typical heterosexual nuclear family dynamics, and that's the extent of its politics, making it mostly harmless. In this context, I think it would make a bit more sense to ask ourselves what exactly counts as political. The Daily Wire has spent years complaining about what they would call forced diversity in media, and this platform is a direct response to the supposed political activism of Disney. To create a platform that goes out of its way to avoid diversity, to counter what it believes its political encroachment, is a political act. That they may call it apolitical only says something about their biases on what should be considered normal in children's entertainment. To them, normal is not including any LGBT characters or avoiding any discussion or mention of topics such as race or climate change. Normal, for them, means kids wouldn't see any of this until they were older. And when they do, it'd be some kind of aberration in the world. That is, a distortion created by left-wing politics interrupting their normal world. What this means for children who live in families that include members of the LGBT community or face issues such as racism aren't really considered. I guess their lives aren't normal, and The Daily Wire doesn't seem any reason why their lives should be reflected in any of their entertainment. And these children from the more typical families would lose the benefit of understanding their friends who have less traditional family dynamics. The Daily Wire is expecting kids to live in a world where none of these ideas can impact them until they're older and can effectively label them as abnormal. What makes all of this even more ridiculous is that there's nothing inherently political about belonging to any of these historically underrepresented groups. These people exist and have always existed for as long as people have been around. They're just as normal as any other kind of person. These identities have been politicized for a variety of reasons, whether it's to extract free labor, use them as a political wedge issue, or many other reasons. To deliberately exclude these groups is far more political than including them, because to acknowledge these people exist is just acknowledging reality. To pretend they don't, or that children need to be protected from them, and that society needs to intervene to make that happen, is to politicize a group of people based on their identity. Kids can see a gay parent and it's not going to absolutely shatter their mind or indoctrinate them into some kind of extreme political identity. Something may feel normal because it's something that's been done for centuries, but that doesn't make it okay. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't have a new normal that lets these people exist in our world. If someone thinks two women kissing in a children's cartoon will damage them, it's not because gay people are dangerous. It's because that person has bought into a political fiction that gay people prey on children, and that certain politicians need to be elected to protect you from that fiction. Just like The Daily Wire needs to pretend that there's a problem with Disney so they can sell you their streaming service. They're inventing a problem and selling a solution. One where politicians get power and influence, and The Daily Wire gets all that subscriber money. All of this is political. But if we're talking about the impact of Bent Key specifically, there may be no impact whatsoever if people aren't actually using the thing. Looking at the performance on the Apple Store, we can see that the Bent Key app has been rated about 1,800 times, and on the Google Play Store, it has 1,400 ratings. The Google page also gives us a more useful metric of 50,000 plus downloads. I've been keeping an eye on that download number over the month it's launched, and that number has been pretty steady. So if it's growing at all, it's not doing it terribly quickly. A generous estimate of these numbers would put downloads at around 200,000. Leaving that high download number alone, we also have to take into consideration that anyone with a Daily Wire Plus subscription, last reported at being over 1 million people, is getting Bent Key for free. So in all likelihood, this app is not nearly where it needs to be to earn enough to sustain itself. But to be fair, it's only been a month, and it takes time to build an audience. The people who are signing up now are the Daily Wire faithful who will happily lap up everything they do. The fact that a minority of its subscriber base seem to download this app doesn't necessarily mean that other people won't look for it in the future. But to do that, they have to drive people towards its audience with a big premiere, which is why the Daily Wire is going big with its first feature for Ben Key, Snow White and the Evil Queen starring Brett Cooper. If you have no idea who that is, she's an actress turned Daily Wire talking ed who does pretty well on YouTube. As you might have guessed, this movie was created in response to Disney announcing that they're doing a live-action Snow White, which everyone quickly labeled as woke because the actress who plays Snow White isn't white, and the actors who played the dwarves were of various body types and ethnicities. 
Of course, maybe the dwarves are now all going to be CG according to a more recent image, so who knows what this final product will eventually look like. The Daily Wire version of the Snow White seems like something you'd see from Asylum, a rather notorious production company that responds to various popular Hollywood movies with their own slightly altered versions. For instance, they responded to Top Gun with Top Gunner, they responded to The Fast and the Furious with Fast and Fierce, or maybe most similarly here, they responded to the live-action Disney Aladdin with Adventures of Aladdin. You don't have to change the name around too much when the character is already in the public domain. I have no idea if Ben Key will be able to copy this blueprint for success, but it's certainly a strategy that Asylum has made work. It's also kind of weird that, again, to differentiate themselves from Disney, they are just copying them with a lower budget. And before anyone asks, I will probably do a review for the Snow White movie. They're claiming to be sticking close to the original, which I assume means the Brothers Grimm version, so it'll hopefully end authentically, with the evil queen being forced to wear red-hot slippers and then dancing to her death. The Daily Wire's foray into entertainment began several years ago, when they started putting movies on their streaming service. The Daily Wire needs these projects to help them break into the mainstream, and so far that hasn't happened. They are planning on releasing their first drama series in 2024, though, based on the Pendragon Cycle books. They also mentioned they are adapting Atlas Shrugged into something in the future. Of course, we had a series of movies that adapted Atlas Shrugged a few years ago that were a complete bomb, but I guess they're going to give it a shot now. Personally, I'd be more confident in the Pendragon series being anything other than a train wreck if it wasn't also being directed by Jeremy Boring. Though he does have a little bit of experience directing, I'm not sure a big expensive drama series is something you want to put in the hands of a novice, although it'll probably be a lot more fun if it is a train wreck. It makes the whole thing seem like a vanity project, and when vanity projects get mainstream attention, it's usually for the wrong reason. Oh, hi, Mark. The path to success for Bent Key only exists outside of the usual conservative media bubble. The Daily Wire is betting pretty big on this, as Matt Walsh mentions in one clip. People need to support it. If they don't, it could be a disastrous failure. It could take the whole company down, given the amount of financial investment we've put into it. This statement, along with statements from Boring and others at the Daily Wire, taken alongside the huge dollar amounts being thrown around, suggests that this service is a big gamble for the company. The Daily Wire has a history of stepping out of its usual comfort space of conservative commentary. In 2022, after Harry's Razors dropped its advertisements with the Daily Wire, Boring launched Jeremy's Razors, a supposedly non-woke alternative to Harry's. And when Hershey's used a trans woman in an ad, Boring launched Jeremy's Chocolate, which is supposedly non-woke, even though it has pronouns on its package. It's the same reactionary philosophy that created Bent Key and the Snow White adaptation, creating products based on outrage. While it seems like a good idea to use the marketing of outrage that they helped create, there's a big difference between selling chocolate and a streaming service. Looking at Jeremy's Chocolate and Razors really quickly, these are white label products. For those unfamiliar with what those are, a white label product is something you buy in bulk from a distributor. For example, you buy chocolate in bulk and then have custom labels printed on them. The Daily Wire isn't spending any money researching and developing these products. They're being made by other people and the Daily Wire is slapping their logo on them and selling them for a higher price. You may have noticed children selling chocolate to raise money for field trips. It's the same basic idea. But instead of sending little Billy to the Science Center, you instead are spending $18.74 on four generic chocolate bars to somehow own the libs. These chocolates and grooming items aren't any better than some no-name brand you might find sold on Alibaba. But customers pay a premium to signify that they are part of a culture war, and they are outraged at the antics of the left and the profit made from that outrage goes straight into the Daily Wire's pocket. A year later, after being announced, Jeremy's razors seem to be struggling. Again, we don't have any numbers other than what the Daily Wire has given us, but even what few they've announced don't reveal a very rosy picture. As Miles Key for The Rolling Stone puts it in his article, the Daily Wire has perhaps strategically chosen not to reveal how many are currently subscribed to the Razor service, only reporting in their latest update that Jeremy's Razors have moved 130,000 units, less than three Razors per original subscription if the 45,000 subscriptions at launch estimate was accurate. These products are basically low-level scams, selling cheap products to turn a quick buck, getting some of those outrage dollars. This streaming service is a whole other beast, though. 
If the Daily Wire's numbers are to be believed, they have spent tens of millions of dollars getting this project off the ground, no doubt much of that going towards expensive licensing fees for its content and producing their own programming. Whatever you may think of Chip Chilla or Mabel McClay, they undoubtedly had more money invested into them than the chocolate bars and razors. But the problem is, much like the chocolate bar and razors, the streaming service only seems to appeal to people based on the amount of outrage or anger they feel towards the supposed wokeness of Disney. And they can't rely on that same conservative audience spending its money to own the libs to carry them to their dreams of being an entertainment company. They need to make some kind of mainstream breakout to recoup all these expenses and turn a profit. And so far, that just isn't happening. I'm sure they're saving costs by hiring friends and employees to handle creative duties, but if Ben Key fizzles out and never earns back the money spent, this could be a very costly loss for the company. My feelings on that are best summed up by Mabel McClay. Wasn't that something? I want to thank the wonderful YouTuber Zoe B for the assist she had in some of the research for this video. Everyone go check out her channel. Her videos are fantastic. And make sure you subscribe to her as well. While I'm very skeptical that Bent Key will have a long and healthy life, The Daily Wire does have a history of throwing money at failing projects for weirdly long lengths of time. This one seems like it's a little too costly to do it for the long term, though. I hope it just sticks around long enough for that Snow White movie to come out so I can make a video about it. I have a very fun idea on how to cover it, and I am looking forward to making that video. If you're looking forward to seeing my videos in the future, though, do consider becoming a patron or a member to the channel. You can find a link to that in the description box under this video. Members get their names in the credits, like these lovely people here, and they also get early access to videos and fun little extras that pop up every now and again. If you would like to support the channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, and do hit the bell for notifications. Thank you all so much for watching.